Hello viewers, as you know I like to interview people who have been in abusive cults and particularly people who have been in the Jehovah's Witness organisation and who have a story to tell and today's guest is no different. I'm delighted to introduce to the channel Miranda Noonan Lung. Thank you for having me. So Miranda, perhaps you could fill us in on your background and how you came to be involved with Jehovah's Witnesses. So I am a third generation JW. Um, both of my parents are Jehovah's Witnesses. My grandparents were both Jehovah's Witnesses. So I grew up um, going to the Kingdom Hall, um, you know, back then three times a week. Um, it was just, I was raised in it. I was raised in it. Sure. And I understand that the, I mean, obviously it, we're, everyone's familiar with the fact that Jehovah's Witnesses aren't allowed to receive blood transfusions, but I understand that as a child, this impacted you quite heavily. Yes. So when I was eight weeks old, I experienced, I forgot exactly what it's called, but I experienced extreme hemorrhaging. And um, so I was rushed to the hospital. Um, doctors were scrambling. It was just, it got to the point where I required a blood transfusion. Um, my parents were adamant about not giving me one, and they stood by that. Um, and what had happened to me at that point was I had flatlined. I was considered gone. So the doctors reported to my parents, you know, she's gone, we can't do anything. Behind the scenes, there was an intern doctor um, who was working on me, and he decided to just go ahead with the procedure without consulting them. And, um, you know, eventually they were notified, but he went ahead, gave me the transfusion, and was able to save my life. Um, the funny story is, is that my middle name is Sherry, and my mom's friend growing up was named Sherry. And she had experienced a similar situation when she was about 16. And she was denied a blood transfusion, and she passed away. So the irony of us sharing a name is very unique. It's a very odd situation. So I'm very passionate about giving blood and very anti their stance on the issue. It's, it's, it blows my mind that you can deny someone that kind of care. It's just astonishing that you went through that and by all rights you shouldn't be speaking to us because you had been given a death sentence by your parents and just yep. by a twist of fate, there was uh, someone in the hospital who, who did the right thing, and that's that's why we're speaking to you. Have, you. have you been in touch with this individual at all? So, coincidentally, I ran into him a few years later. We were just kind of in passing, and um, my mom was like, oh, that was the doctor who worked on you or whatever. And I was like, oh, cool. And he went into more details, and he was like, you know, for some reason I had a McDonald's, you know, straw stuck in my pocket and um, you were just the right size. Like you didn't fit the tubes that were necessary. And he was like, in this whole thing, you know, he's like, I just felt like motivated to go through with this. And it was just it was pretty cool. Um, unfortunately, I was still young at the time, so I didn't understand the complete situation. I also didn't get the full story until I was much older. So I couldn't interact with him the way that I had wanted to. I was only about like 11 or 12, but it was cool to be able to, you know, see him again and be like, hey, yeah, I'm still here. Wow, that, that's just an astonishing story. And I, I'm so grateful that he, he took that action. Did you get any, were you treated at all differently because this had happened as you grew up? Um, it was under wraps. Nobody knew about it. Um, my parents didn't tell anyone. I think you know, there's only a few people who know the full situation. Um, there's like there was one elder um, who ended up moving away, and then um, some of my aunts and uncles. But other than that, nobody really knows. So, so it wasn't like they were holding it against you that you'd received a blood transfusion necessarily. No, because nobody knew about For it. Sure. I think if if that had come out, things would have been a little bit different. I can imagine. So, obviously, here you are growing up as a Jehovah's Witness. To what extent did you get involved with the religion before things started to unravel? 
So I was always the poster JW child. We were the poster JW family. You know, dad's an elder, mom's a pioneer, sister is going to Bethel or going to become a pioneer, and then my younger brother. Like, we were just, we were at every assembly, we were showcased, we were interviewed. I've been in magazines, I've been in watchtowers, I've had stories published. Like, we were just very involved. Um, as soon as I turned 18, I decided to pioneer. Before that, I was baptized at about 11 or 12 years old. Um, the funny thing about my baptism is the series of questions that they give you. And I think that's that was one of the things that always stood out to me because in the two questions that they ask you at baptism, it's like, are you going to dedicate yourself to God or whatever? I can't remember the exact verbiage. And then do you realize that this recognizes you as a Jehovah's Witness? And that always kind of bothered me, like starting at 12 years old. I was like, hold up. This is a little odd. I'm going to still do it. But I, this, it just, it always stood out to me. So at the assembly, when they have you stand up and agree to those two questions, I never agreed to being a Jehovah's Witness because I didn't think that that was what my baptism should be about. So that was my little rebellious streak at 12 years old. But, so did you, so did you say yes um, when, verbally when that question was asked? No. Nope. You didn't? I did not. Wow. That's interesting. I didn't get caught, which is <laughs> interesting. That's, that's interesting because thinking about <laughs> it, all of the baptisms I've attended, you just assume everyone's saying yes. You're not literally going yep. around and checking that everyone's saying yes. That, yep. That's incredible. Um, wow. So you end up pioneering. How, how does that work out for you? Um, not so great. I, um, I got my 100 hours in August, and by then I was fried. And I was like, okay, I don't know what to do from here. I don't have, you know, I, I, I didn't have the education graduating from high school. Um, and I was like, okay, what do I do? I'm not making any kind of money. I don't really know where to go from here. So <laughs> my, I was raised, uh, homeschooled, so I wasn't allowed to go to public school. Um, when I graduated and I started pioneering, I was like, okay, I need to figure out how to, to supplement this. And my mom agreed that I was allowed to go to dental school and she came with me. So it was like a six month course. We went together. Um, and then I had my, my dental certificate so then I could support my pioneering at the end of that, that section. So you can't go to pioneer school until you do, you know, a certain amount of, of proof that you can actually do this. Mm -hmm. So when it came to pioneer school, I had gone to my boss and I was like, okay, I need, you know, these two weeks off in August being the dedicated, you know, Joe's windows. So I was like, okay, I need to take off. And he said, if I went to pioneer school, I would lose my job. So I didn't have a job. I went to pioneer school, and then I was I was toast again. Um, and then I just I kind of struggled in fitting in with the real world because it was like, okay, now I have to be around these worldly people. I don't know how to function. I don't know how to process. Um, luckily, I had been enrolled in a dance studio um, by my grandmother. She paid for all my classes. And um, so that was my taste of the real world. And I had really connected to one of my teachers there. She became my mentor, or my best friend, and she was kind of my outside source. And I would tell her about what I was doing, and she was always very confused. She was like, is this making you happy? And I'd be like, sure, it's making me super happy. And she's like, all right, you know, I'll support you, but just keep in mind that there are other things, you know, in the universe. Um, I became very depressed soon after pioneer school. Um, and I didn't really know how to handle it. So I had gone to my mentor and friend and she had told me that not to be afraid of saying how I felt. I, at that point I had felt like pioneering was a waste of my time. I wasn't getting anyone at the door who was actually interested. I got more confused. Um, so I started going online and quite frankly, I think I came across one or two of your videos and I was like, Okay, this this is like way too logical for being, you know, an apostate worldly person. You know, and just researching stuff and looking stuff up made me realize that okay, there's there's like hidden secrets in the, in the universe that we're not being told as Jehovah's, as um excuse me as Jehovah's Witnesses, and I wanted to know why. 
So I talked to my mentor and friend, and she was like, how do you feel about this religion? Do you feel like it's right for you? And I was like, absolutely not. I don't anymore. And she was like, okay, remember that the world is not a bad place. The world is full of things to learn about, things to to discover, and it's not bad to ask questions. And I was like, oh, my gosh, this is, like, mind-blowing for me because no one's ever said that before. So she gave me a website that was, like, a, I can't remember what it was, but it's closed down at this point. But it was a forum where you could just blast and tell everyone your problems. And they were all XJW, so they would tell you, okay, well, this is these are the steps that you need to take if you want to be able to get out. Um, my mother found out that I was not only severely depressed, but, like, questioning stuff. My mom found a psychiatrist in the congregation to come speak to me and convince me to go back. And um, it got to the point where everything that I was telling the psychiatrist, she realized that this was all way above her pay grade. And she was like, okay, I'm a JW, so I can't tell you not to be here. Here's the name of somebody else who you can talk to that can help you figure out what to do because this is not, you know, how, my how, how come you had a... How, this is quite rare for there to be such a thing as a JW psychologist. So she she had just been reinstated. She had oh, right. okay. been to fellowship. She had went to school, became a psychiatrist, and then came back. Psychiatrist. Right. Psychiatrist. Okay, that makes and sense. And then came back. Yeah. And, and, and she soon realized she was really completely closer. over her head and needed yep. to pass you on to someone else. Yeah. Yep. So I got this the name of somebody, and my mom was super against going to this person um and i was like okay i need to go because i'm not myself so she finally caved we went and um that lady was just like she had us both in the room at one point and she was talking about stuff and my mom's like okay you can't see her alone i have to come to every session blah 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 and i was like okay fine whatever <laughs> I would just spill to her and with my mom in the room. And then finally the psychologist realized, okay, I need to split you guys up. She kicked me out of the room. And um, my mom was like, okay, you know, we're here because she needs to go back to the religion. This is a family thing or else like she's going to die in Armageddon. And the psychologist was like, okay, I'll teach her how to be a better JW then. So she kicked my mom out, got me back in the room and she's okay, we're going to help you escape now. And I was like, okay, good. Thank you. That's brilliant. That's excellent. Genius. That's like Genius. Uh, using theocratic warfare against the JWs. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> so dumb. It's yeah. ridiculous that mm. that has to be done. Yeah. Um, so, so at that time, I was I was browsing online, and um, I accidentally stumbled into my now husband um, virtually. So we were connected online. So we would chat online. We'd break stuff down. We'd chat, and we ended up you know, starting a relationship. Um, my parents, once they found out about it, they got really, really aggressive. And I just saw a different side of the both of them. Um, growing up, there was always tension and stuff. But just knowing what I knew at that point, that this was not normal, I knew that something was wrong. So I told the psychologist about it, and we just, we had needed to find a way for me to move out as the first step of, escaping the JW world. So she helped me do that. My dance mentor helped me do that. Um, from there, I became, I just went inactive. I just stopped going, um, which was a battle at home. I can um, imagine, yeah. Yeah. Um, when I had stopped going to meetings, um, my mother said, oh, this is the psychologist. She's telling you all crazy things. That plus you're looking online. You're looking at apostate stuff. And I was like, I need to get out of this religion or I'm going to end up killing myself. And um, she basically said that it was better to do that than have God kill me at Armageddon. That is, um, that is just unbelievable to turn around and that say was... that to someone who you have brought into the world and cradled in your arms as such as the most precious thing in the universe and then to turn around and say that to them just blows my blows my mind it just that was the last straw for me and it made me realize how confused jw's are in general because they just they think that this is everything and the the organization has told them that 
this is the right way, that you are going to die. And they believe this so strongly, and it just, it really ticks me off. How, how did, how did you feel when, what, how did, what's it like when your mother says that to you? I, I had always, we were never really close. Um, she would tell me that stuff all the time growing up. If I didn't want to go to a meeting or I felt sick or I was fidgeting, I would always get comments like that. Um, you know, like, oh, I, I'm, I'm being satanic because I don't want to go to the meeting. I'm, I deserve to be in the dark and she'd lock me in my room. And it was just, being, you know, 18 at this point, I didn't realize that I had the right to break off from this. I still felt controlled. So when she had told that to me, I realized that something was wrong. And that was just the last straw for me with the religion in general. And I just, I felt broken, but I also felt empowered. Like, okay, I know I'm doing the right thing at this point. Hmm. Did you still uh, because in in my experience waking up from the witnesses can be like a gradual process and it doesn't necessarily happen overnight so were you still holding a candle for any element for any aspect of the religion at that point or had you just realized fully that it wasn't something that you could ever be a part of i feel like ever since my baptism it was just a gradual fallout of not believing it anymore. Right. And it just, I, you know, at that point I still, you know, you have thoughts every now and then when you're first leaving, like, Oh, am I doing the right thing? You know, everything wrong is happening to me. So it must be that I was angry, but then like you fall back and, you know, I went back on those forums and I would read and I would, I just, I broke everything down because I wanted to find out, okay, this religion started from somewhere. It's not, you know, it's not, it's not real if it started from a human being. Um, what's the origin? Where do the books come from? Where? What makes the governing the governing body the authority for this faith? What are their credentials? Like you like to say, what's the what's the foundation for it? And it just it convinced me that it wasn't legit. And when, and when you start asking questions along those lines, you realize that there really is no foundation and that it really is just a bunch of guys saying, hey, we're spokespersons for God, deal with it. Um, so, wow. Um, and what what was the fallout? I mean, you mentioned going inactive. Um, has it Did it deteriorate from that point or are things still at pretty much the same, uh, in pretty much the same place? So, I... Yeah, I mean, I'm still considered inactive. Um, my my parents know it. Like, okay, so I I left the house. I moved out. I started my own life. I ended up moving out to Colorado um, after taking a few trips out here to meet hubby. And um, things just went from there. So I moved out. I started my own life. I, I stayed inactive. I think I went to one memorial when I came out here. And when I was in that building... It felt so wrong. It felt like a big commercial. Why did and you I go to like, the okay, memorial? I, I, I was still guilt-driven. Right. I still had that, like, in the back of my mind, okay, if I'm not going to be a Jehovah's Witness, I have to at least go to the memorial. Like, that's just that's about me and, and Jesus or whatever. And I went there, and I sat there, and I got up halfway, like, okay, this is totally a commercial. I know way too much at this point to be sitting in this building. And I just left, and... Yeah. That was it. Wow. So, um, because so, obvi obviously you've, you've done, the, I'm not the first person who you've spoken to with, with this story. Um, are you, are you concerned about being kind of retroactively disfellowshipped or anything or being chased by your elders? I don't care. Um, I don't think that my elders have any authority over me at this point. So if I mean if they feel the need to don't go and disfellowship me, that's their problem. But I personally don't feel like I need to confess to anyone what I'm doing. I feel um, like I am able to help other people by being involved in the community, and that's kind of where I have my my purpose right now. Is I just say it it helps me to help other people. 
Wow. Well, I think that's enormously brave and admirable of you to, to, to take that position. And it's not a position that comes to everyone easily, but um, I, I think that... I think you're making the right choice. I really do. And and it's obvious to me that you have kind of shed this burden of, of fear and control. Um, if there were any, if there was anyone watching this video who was torn about their beliefs or wondering what to do about whether to stay in the religion or not, what would be your advice to them? Um, just research it. You know, if, if you're afraid to look at these worldly publications, open any watchtower and look up any quote from that source. Because I feel like that's another big eye opener for people. Um, just if you have questions, don't be afraid to ask them. If you're afraid to ask a question, then you're, you've already been controlled. You need to be able to be who you are and, and ask those questions. You need to be able to find stuff out for yourself. Realize that the world is not a bad place. They are not. You are not going to go out. You're not going to leave the kingdom hall. You're not going to leave the religion and find a bunch of drunk druggies who are like trying to convince you to smoke pot with them. That's not what the world is about, and it's not this dark, scary place. That's true, and and that's one thing that comes across strongly in your story is the fact that you had your dance instructor, who was your mentor. You had uh, your psychologist who were doing nothing but looking out for you uh, to the extent where they were helping you more than your own parents. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it, I just cannot get my head around the fact that this belief system dehumanizes people to the point where you no longer remember the, the bond that you have with your child. And speaking as a father, I can never imagine turning around to my child and saying that it would be better if you kill yourself. <laughs> it's just, I just laugh thinking about it, but that is actually how the religion makes JW parents think. It's sad. It's, it's a warped viewpoint. And I wish more people could see it that way. Indeed. And, uh, and I, for one, am very grateful that uh, that, that doctor took that straw out of his pocket and put it to good use because I think the world is already a better place from hearing this story, but it's it's certainly clear that um, that your life was saved by him doing that, and I'm very grateful. Thank you. So, viewers, what an astonishing story, and I'm sure you will have found Miranda's experience every bit as inspiring as I have. Please don't forget to subscribe to the John Cedars channel for more interviews like this one. And as always, thank you for watching.